Hey everyone, welcome to our presentation. Today we're going to be talking about re-envisioning community, the basics of providing mental and emotional support, and I'm so excited to introduce these wonderful panelists I have with me. Um, just quickly, we're going to be going over what community is and what that looks like and going through some understandings of how support and safety are so critical, especially during these times. Um, to introduce myself, I am Jessica Pomerantz, she, her pronouns. I have worked in the New York City bar industry for quite a while. I was also getting my master's in mental health counseling up there, and then just recently re relocated to Columbia, South Carolina, where I'm currently getting my PhD in clinical psych. Um, and now I'm so excited to introduce this wonderful panel after you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sabrina Kudic. I go by they, them. I have been a part of the New York and Chicago hospitality scene for the last seven years or so um, and have slowly transitioned out of that and became an erotic blueprint coach. So that's currently what I'm doing, working with couples, individuals in reclaiming their pleasure and finding the joy in life and all things sex related. Um, and that's really so intertied with everything that I learned in hospitality and how to care for each other. So super excited to be doing the work I am and being here with you all today, even though it's not how we envisioned it. <laughs> I'm happy still to be a part of this panel and be able to be a part of the discussion. Hi, everybody. I'm Amanda Gunderson. I'm she, her pronouns. Um, I started in this industry a long time ago. I started as a cocktail waitress in the late 90s and started bartending uh, shortly after and was working in that side of the career for a very long time until I switched over about a decade ago to um, being a little bit more on the supplier side. Uh, so I've worked with small batch spirits and um, some of the biggest names in the game and a few years ago, I started a nonprofit that's focused on uh, educational funding and emergency funding for the hospitality industry called Another Round, Another Rally. And that's me. Thank you. So just before we get started, we are gonna be talking about mental health, emotional support. Sometimes those conversations can feel overwhelming, especially if this is one of your first times engaging in this discussion. So I just wanted to lay some ground rules for us to really um, make sure that this is a safe space. The first one being that this is not therapy. We're not here to kind of process things and go over stuff. Um, so this is voluntary. You can remove yourself at any time from viewing this. Um, it was a little more applicable when we were alive, but now that it's recorded, please feel free to press pause and take a second at any time that you need it. I know that some of these conversations can get overwhelming and that is totally fine, but, um, N make sure that you leave space for yourself and your own mental health as you watch these. And um, I also want to speak to knowing your own boundaries in that way. So I know that you want to learn this information and want to be present, but just because it is important information, and, but you do feel overwhelmed does not mean that you don't have to remove yourself at any time. So we're, I want to start out by just kind of talking about what community is and defining it. I think when we say com the word community in general, so many things pop into your heads. You have a schema in your head of what a community is. Um, and so I just kind of Googled what is community. And this is the definition that came up. A feeling of fellowship with others as a result of a shared common attitude, interest, or goal. And I think that's so important because there's something always shared going on. And that's, um, I think when it comes down to the crux of when whatever community you think of, that's always going to be your base. I also nerded out a little bit on the right side here of the slide with um, an ecological model of community. And so it, I really just wanted to show how it man manifested in different tiers. So you start out thinking about the bar community. That's what Tales is. We're here to share in um, our interests and goals together. But then you can also think about it like 
when you're at Tales physically and you're like, oh, well, in my New York City bar community or in my Los Angeles bar community and break it down a little bit further. And so then say you're talking to someone that lives in the same town as you and you're like, oh, well, at our bar, we do this. So that's another form of community. And then even further, of course, you always have the dynamics within a restaurant or a bar. You have the front of house versus back of house. You have the bartenders versus the servers or support staff, and not necessarily versus, but just kind of creating those same communities throughout. And I think that's just really important when we start to think about community. What we're doing every day is so influenced by who we think of as our community. Mm -hmm. I find it so fascinating too, for me personally, it was, I could never, it was never like an escape leaving the bar community. I, I was always, bringing that back into where I am now. How do I engage my community, whether it's my partner, whether it's my family or my friends, like those are all communities within themselves. Um, and like, I've learned that through separating it, I actually create more of this disconnection when in reality, there's such a beautiful connection in community because it's a constant engagement of your surroundings. And we are always constantly engaged with our surroundings. So we are always in community, whether it be with someone or without, with ourselves, it's always present. Um, so it's a beautiful thing to kind of look at the micro and then the whole big macro of it all. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such a good point, especially that no matter where you are, or what you're doing, there is always some sort of community component being engaged, whether you're just walking down the street or you're you know at work you're always in a community right one of the things i really love about um, the bar community too is that it's also the guest that's there and it could be a different set of guests on any given day so you could have your regulars and you really they walk in and you know what to pour them right away and then you have a uh, different person, different personalities, different people that you're meeting every single shift, every single time. And so one of the tricks of the great bartender is to understand what that person needs very quickly, um, understand what kind of joke they'll respond to, you know, understand uh, where they're at. And there's only a few reasons why people really come into a bar, you know, they're thirsty or they're celebrating something or they're sad about something or they're meeting somebody there or they're on a date or you know they're just hanging with friends but there's it's a it's a very communal thing the reason why people come into a bar so it's a great place to um you know be able to unwind i was talking to a friend the other day who was saying that one of the things he misses the most during covid is that feeling of unwinding you know um, but that's what you get from your community I love that. I always tell people who are maybe outside of our community of the bar culture, I always say a bar is the one place you go to celebrate your biggest achievements, but you also go to mourn your biggest um, sadnesses. And like, where, el where else do you have both of those in tangent at the same time, right? Yeah. Right. And I think what I love most too, the bar community is like, even in your sadness and in, in that like moment of like grief that you can experience, there's just like an uplifting of, I see you, I hear you, I feel you. What can I get? What, what do you need? Um, and that's such a beautiful place to just find yourself giving. And that's really where I'm like, oh my God, I miss that, that like, I'm always having people coming up and being like, they need something. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have something that they need. I got this. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's such a beautiful transition into, you know, as we start to talk about what is safety and we'll talk about what is support after, but you, we give as um, industry professionals so much. And so creating those spaces where you are giving to your guests full heartedly, but also protecting yourself in certain ways too. We're so inclined to kind of um, do everything and anything for our guests to make them happy. That's why we're in this industry. We want to, we're people pleasers, you know, but yeah. there's so much room to give up parts of ourselves too. And that's when we really need to break down what is safety as something more than just physically, you know, again, I Googled the definition of safety because I was curious what that, you know, looked like. And it's so focused on that physical safety. And there's so many deeper layers to that that are 
so important to discuss too. Yeah, absolutely. And just to like touch on safety, we, we didn't get to it on the disclaimer, but um, the conversation of consent is so important when it comes to our own personal safety and simple definition of consent is permission. Um, so it's a question before doing an action and then followed with a yes or a no. So it's, you know, I've come into places where I've been like touched on the shoulder and like it wasn't asked beforehand. So that's like a breakage on my consent. You didn't ask me, I didn't say yes or no, and you just kind of went for it. Um, and I think creating that safety within us is starting with those small things of like, hey, can I, would you like a hug? Can I go for a hug? Instead of just automatically assuming, because that's kind of how we get into the rhythm of being in the bar, we assume. It's like, oh, it's my friend. Oh, it's this, it's that. Like, but knowing where our boundaries lie, knowing how to create that safety for ourselves and for our guests, most importantly, um, is crucial to keeping us safe as well as them safe. Absolutely. And I love that idea of like emotional and mental safety is just as important as physical safety, right? And we do make so many assumptions because the bar industry is so fast paced, moving so quickly, and it is hard to kind of stop and pause. But I think that that's just a pattern that has occurred and isn't necessarily hard to change as long as you're active rather than passive in making those changes, right? Like, why is it so difficult to ask a question rather than make an assumption? Yeah, I think it's also something that is, we've all been dealing with this year, there's just been layer on top of layer and that there's a, you know, this racial injustice piece, I think is really highlighting the fact that we need more diversity and more inclusion in every industry, uh, but ours in particular. And I think a lot of people are throwing those words around diversity and inclusion with the best of intent and the best heart. But what you usually do is you focus on the diversity portion without really understanding what you need to have the inclusion piece. And I think for any, any underrepresented group to feel comfortable in any space, you need this feeling of safety first as the base level. Mm -hmm. I think that's such a good point. I've been watching all of the panels this week and been really so inspired with some of the conversations that have been had. And to say, you know, to put one woman in your space or to put one black person in your space is not what diversity is and I think right. so many people think that I included that person they now have a seat at the table that's not what that looks like and why would someone subject themselves to that lack of safety having a seat doesn't necessarily ensure this sense of belonging um and I think that's really how do we how do we make people feel like they belong? How do we ensure that? How do we create that um, everywhere that we go? Because I know personally for myself, I've been in places where I had that script of I don't belong here, I don't belong here, I don't belong here, and how that rippled into my like life in general just kind of backtracked me to a place where it was like I just didn't I just didn't feel safe wherever I was. So how do I create that? It's all about creating that safety for myself and like knowing where my yeses and my noes lie. Knowing, do I wanna be a part of this conversation or not? Can I walk away? Can I, you know, there's so, especially with like bar, I feel like we get into like deep talks and just like overall like discussions that get edgy and we don't know when to stand up and say like, hey, that was wrong. Um, I've experienced harassment and one of my previous jobs and I remember staff would come up to me and be like hey like don't don't get him fired because he's the only he's our last hope I was like really that's our last hope <laughs> so it's you know it comes down to like how how are our managers how are like higher ups but also like what can we do for ourselves um, knowing that we're standing in a place where there is no right or wrong but that this is how I, this person makes me feel and it doesn't feel safe. Um, and how do we take that back? How do we create that? So, Yeah, I, I think that is such a good point is to understand where you feel safe. 
um, it, this is such a, an important piece, this, the, the base of a pyramid, this safety feeling at work. Um, and I think also, Jess, you have brought up a really good point about having a seat at the table. I one time heard uh, Jackie Summers talking and he said something that was so profound that I have chewed on it ever since then. He was said, um, if you have a seat at the table, but you can't bring somebody up to the table, then you don't actually really have a seat at the table. So you might, somebody might be saying, oh, I, I've got this person a seat at the table, but unless you feel safe in that environment, unless you can bring some other people into that environment with you, it's not really, it's all, you know, chatter. Yeah, absolutely. Those are both phenomenal pieces. Jackie Summers has some really deep things that he says that really get me every time. But um, I think that there, it's also important because when you're thinking about having that seat, you're thinking about you know being in a space where you're assessing your physical boundaries first and foremost, and then kind of almost pushing away your emotional and mental boundaries because dealing with your physical boundaries is so crucial for us you know, what does that look like? Why is it so difficult for us? And how many things go under the table just because of, I'm so tired of hearing the industry we're in. I'm so sick of that being, you know, a mitigator for violence, both emotional and mental and physical. It's just, that's not an excuse that's not acceptable anymore. Yeah. And I, I think something that we can make this whole panel about Jackie Summers because I love, I love, love, love everything he writes. Um, I resonate so deeply with it. And I think it's what I see most from Jackie is this sense of vulnerability that comes from talking of direct experiences and really pushing the envelope and saying like, hey, this is, this is how I feel. This is not also, this is not just me, but this is how constituents of mine have also felt. Um, and there's, it's unfortunate that there had to be a level of feeling to be silenced. Um, and I find it fascinating that the antonym of safety is vulnerability when I think vulnerability is the thing that connect us most to our safety because it's asking that question of what do I need? And I know in restaurants and I know for like, personally for myself, I've worked in places where it's like, I can't get what I need. Sometimes the need, like I need like a new knife so that I can stop chopping my fingers off every time. Um, and that's not always provided, but like basic needs of, can I talk honestly and openly about what's happening in my life to people that I trust? Um, am I being met with criticism, neglect? Um, are my needs just kind of being brushed under the table as like a, yeah, 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 we'll get to it kind of thing. Um, but the more we get to voice that, those needs, that vulnerability, that piece of like, hey, this is, this is not okay. This is, I need more. Um, and I think we can start getting into a place now where we can start asking openly for that and really shrinking down that whole like oh it's part of the industry mentality um because we are so far along in this industry that we can't keep looking back to how it always was we need to start looking ahead at to what we are creating now um and we have that voice we have that pull we can create that vision um and how do we create that but with all of our supports absolutely and you were talking about needs, so I just skipped ahead to this next slide. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, let me tie that in there. <laughs> I just love this. My nerdy research side loves this chart so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I, You have your basic, the physical, everything from up top self. It's so, you know, our bar industry, I has those layers in it already. It's already there. Now, how do we all bring ourselves together and elevate it even higher? Um, and it's hard because every individual within this community are in different places, especially with COVID, especially with everything that's going on in our BIPOC community. Like we, we're at a place where we don't know. So this is the place where we get to ask 
<laughs> and like, we don't need to be afraid to ask because we don't know everything. We don't need to know everything. Um, and I think that's such a beautiful gift in remembering that I, I don't know everything. So let me just start with asking, what are some of the challenges in your communities right now? Where do you find yourselves that you feel you need support? What kind of support? What does support look like? Um, and getting to those questions and really branching out from there. Or even if you know that you speak English and Spanish, but your dishwasher doesn't speak English and just Spanish, how do we communicate, how do we bridge it? Because that's, that's leadership, right? It's seeing the problem and then creating the bridge. And so many of us can create those bridges. So it's about empowering that within ourselves and helping, you know, rise. What is it? The, the rising tide lifts all boats. So like we can start looking at it in that sense of, you know, I already know I have my basic needs met, check. I already know my psychological needs are checked, checked. Now, what else do I need? Who do I know that's there that I can bridge with and say, hey, I need help? Because for a long time, I, I couldn't ask that question of I need help. Um, I, I've been sober now for two, over two and a half years and like getting that help, thank you. <laughs> getting that help, oh, took me 10 years. I was 10 years in my disease and it just, I couldn't reach out. I didn't know what that looked like, but that was because I didn't have my basic needs, my basic needs or my psychological needs met. Um, and I needed to really look in and find those for myself first before I could reach out and find someone else that needed it. Um, and now I, I'm, I'm so grateful because I have such an abundance of people that reach out to me that are interested in sobriety that just want to talk. And I think that's beautiful. Like, I'm not trying to sell you on a program or anything of that nature. I'm just here to show you like, hey, maybe like, you don't need to drink every night. I did for 10 years. And let me tell you, nothing really changed. <laughs> it was pretty much the same thing over and over again. And I was so unconscious to my own behaviors that when I did stop, I was able to bring that unconscious to life and really feel what I needed at that moment. Um, and it was just help. Thank you for sharing that. I think you said something that really jumped out to me about being a leader. And I think that when we think about words, sometimes words hold so much weight and you hear the word leader and you like kind of feel like, oh, like that's a lot of pressure, a lot of responsibility. And I would love to discuss with y'all more about how it doesn't have to be that way, right? Like you can be a leader in your own space, in your own community, no matter what kind of dynamics going on in such small ways, just like, you know, Sabs, you mentioned the communication with the dishwasher. That's such a, for someone who is bilingual, that's something that's relatively easy. And attainable. I think setting those small goals and small moments is like really important, especially where we're at today right. in this community. It's funny because like, personally for me, I know I, I am a leader. I know I am a leader. But if you had asked me like five months ago, like, are you a leader? I would have been like, absolutely not. That's too much responsibility. I can't handle that. <laughs> and that's okay, right? We, we are exactly where we need to be in the moment. And where you are is perfect. A leader, you know, when I envisioned a leader in the beginning, I envisioned like, the higher of the high, like people in history books and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, I'm never going to be that kind of leader. Um, but if you look at like the smaller little nuanced things that happen in your everyday life where you get to lead yourself through, like there are days where I just, I can't muster getting up sometimes. So like, I have to be the leader for myself. Like, all right, Sabs, you know, we got a big day going on ahead of us. It's going to be okay. You take your time. We got this whatever you need, we're here. And you know, that's just like building myself up so that I know I'm okay and I'm taken care of. And I feel like oftentimes people want to be the best leaders and then they fail to take the first step, which is just reaching out. So like getting rid of the, the best, the, the, mo the highest, the greatest, like getting rid of all those little adjectives and just lead. 
like what does that actually mean what does that entail it it's just communication it's just creating that level of reaching out finding where all everyone else is and seeing them where they are and creating that conscious connection between it and contributing right contributing to what's going on around us and then celebrating our smallest of wins because oftentimes what happens is, you know, you go off to be the leader that you want to be and then something happens and then it's like you backtrack 10 steps. And it's like, don't, don't smush your sprouts. Like the little seeds that you just planted, like it's going to take time to grow. And badgering ourselves on where we are and where we want to be, if a leader is in us, I, I believe we're all leaders mm -hmm. in all of our respective communities. And you don't need to do anything where you are is beautiful you're leading whether you know it or not <laughs> we lead with our emotions we lead with our our personalities our images like people already see that in us um so it's just embracing that part and not seeing it as like like how i did as a burden like ah oh, now i got i got all these responsibilities i got all these people it's like actually that's a gift that's a total gift um and I never would have thought that way if I didn't, you know, going back to the, the support, like taking care of myself first, filling my cup first, knowing that I need certain things before I can go out and reach to my community. Because if I go out in my community and I'm not feeling 100% there, they're going to get the 70% of me and be like, oh, what happened with Sabrina? <laughs> like are they okay like what's going on um and like i know i can take care of myself and i also know on the days that i can't i do have support that i go to i love that it's um just that idea that it's all about communication um and that sometimes it's as simple as communicating with yourself about what's going on step by step, minute by minute, you know, how you're dealing with get, you know, just putting one foot in front of the other. You're, you can sometimes be leading yourself. I think you're right. A lot of times when people think about leadership, they're like, oh, the next, does that mean I have to try to be the next Martin Luther King Jr., <laughs> you know, or something like that? And you're thinking on such a high level, but um, sometimes that leadership is just having that communication with yourself, pulling yourself through because people are around you. People are in your community and they'll feel that from you. I love that. I agree. I think that's so great. Like you do lead yourself every day and we should empower ourselves to start thinking about it. That way you make active choices, whether you realize it or not, because they've become so routine, right? You do get up every day. You do pull yourself out of the bed most days you you know you do these things you shower you're making active choices every day and so you are leading yourself in that way and people I think people like to disregard the way that others look at them because it's easier when you do that when you're like no one really cares what I'm doing no one's paying attention to me but there but it, it, it's not true and in communities it's happening all the time I'm always observing yeah. people around me because I always am so inspired by everyone yeah. around me as like a for personally for myself like small goals that I, I always set small winnable goals for myself every day so if that means like get up and brush my teeth every morning that's my goal I'm going to do it with a smile. That's my goal. If I don't reach it, that's okay. You know, some days are <laughs> where they are. But, you know, I think for me, what I found so apparent that I wanted to embody for myself was as a leader, I want to be a person that drives connection and not disconnection. So that's my goal. That's like my my higher my hierarchy of needs that's my ultimate goal is like how do i in my community in my life create connection as opposed to disconnection and disconnection is responding out of anger it's responding out of you know lack of resources within myself um a practice that i do pretty often is practicing empathy um and it's 
it's so fascinating because like I was never taught about empathy. We're all empathetic. And yet there are so many times that I've gone towards the opposite, which is sympathy. And it's, it's that sense of like, not, how do I describe it? So whenever I come into a place, it's like, wow, Sabrina, um, we're having a really rough day. I stubbed my toe on the bed when I woke up in the morning and it just kind of spiraled down the hill. And in my mind, I could either be like, ooh, that sucks, you hit your toe. Well, I guess, you're, I guess your day can't get any worse than that. That's sympathy. That's not seeing me where I am. That's kind of just looking at it like, ooh, you stubbed your toe, sorry about that. Like, that's not, that sucks. Empathy for me would be like, all right, Sabs, yeah. I, I hear you that you stubbed your toe. I hear that you are feeling a little down and that your day is spiraling out of control. What else? Is there anything else? And then like allowing for that to kind of just like blossom out. Cause usually what happens for me is it's like, it's like a hangnail. It just kind of gets stuck there. And I just keep trying to wiggle it out and force it out when I could just like take a deep breath and put a bandaid and like say, okay, I have a hangnail. It's going to be all right. We're, I'm going to breathe through this and be present with what's here. Um, and I see it often when it comes to discussions of all kinds, everywhere. I see it, honestly. Um, giving advice when it's not warranted. Um, these are bre breaches of consent. Like, I didn't ask for advice. I just want it. Do you have, I always ask before I say anything that's going on in my life, do you have space to hold for this conversation? And anytime I call a friend, it's like, hey, do you have a moment? I'm going through something. Do you have space to, to hold me through this? And I, I think that's such a beautiful place to start of like, not assuming people are always going to be like the emotional dumpsters, right? But just like asking first before and like getting into the habit of knowing that this person isn't there to fix me, that I, I can do that but I just need to be held. And what does that feel like? Um, and being held in empathy is, you know, to be able to see the world as another sees it, to be non-judgmental, to understand another's feelings and to communicate that understanding of that person's feelings. So there's no fixing involved. It's just kind of witnessing. And it's a really beautiful place. Um, I, I, I use it constantly as a leader, as a coach. Um, and I, I wish I knew about it sooner because I always would be like, ooh, that sucks. Do you need a shot? Do you want a shot? That was always my answer mm. to those tough things All the because it was just like, oh, I'm in the bar industry. Like, what else do we do but take shots? Or like a customer would piss me off. Like, oh, you know what? I'm just going to take a shot. I'll feel better about this. Instead of just like going to the right people that can hold me and then remind me, hey, you're not those people that are creating that feeling. It's okay. You can breathe. I'm here for you. I got you. And that's kind of where our community is. I feel that really often when I'm behind a bar and it's just like, ah, it, it can shift. Our emotions shift. They're come and go. <laughs> They're like waves. <laughs> so being attuned to it and like really understanding your emotions is crucial and asking those questions of like, what's, what's underneath that emotion? What's there? We, um, we learned this technique in couples therapy called, um, I actually don't know what it's called, but it's basically when, when your partner comes to you, you ask them, is this the moment where you need me to listen to you vent? Or is this a moment where you want me to help you problem solve? And yeah. I, I think that's so powerful because you can do that in any dynamic in any relationship. When someone approaches you with a problem, what do you want from me? You know, you've already hypothetically asked, They've asked you for that space to utilize, you know, you as an emotional support, but now what do they want as that emotional support back? Yeah. That, that open communication, just even asking that question, first of all, de-escalates a lot, but really that understanding mm -hmm. of, is this a moment where you just need to get it off your chest or is this a moment where I can help you solve a problem? Because I think yeah. especially in our 
culture, we're such problem solvers, especially in the bar industry. We just want to solve the problem, right? And sometimes you just need an open space to kind of air out what you're feeling. And that's okay, too, as long as that's clear. There's nothing more frustrating than when I'm trying to vent to a friend. And they're like, okay, what are we going to do? How can we solve this? Like, no, no. <laughs> I think there's a book or I know there's like a study of classes that you can actually take that are geared towards nonviolent communication. Um, and that is one of the key points in nonviolent communication is just no, and that's knowing your boundaries um and saying being able to say yes or no because oftentimes we don't even get the question of the yes or no so then you just feel like you have to take care of your partner as they're going through this meanwhile you never were asked so that's just like immediately for me it drains me like my body just dies it's like oh here we are again and like no partner wants to be received with that <laughs> It's like, oh, here they go again. What, what do they need? What do they want from me? Is something that I always used to find myself asking in past relationships before learning um, that I can communicate like, hey, are you looking for advice or do you just need to be held and witnessed in what you're going through? Um, that's usually what I ask my friends when they come to me. And I've had responses of like, wow, you just asking that gave me a breath of air. No, I'm okay. I don't need anything. And like, if I can do that for my friends, I can do that for my community outside. Like, I just need to remember those practices and know that it's okay. It's going to feel weird and awkward in the beginning because it's something new that I'm practicing, but that I can ask first before I do anything. And I don't have to be attached to the answer. So if I call a friend and they're like, ah, I actually don't have the space to hold you right now. Okay. I'll be like, okay, that's great. I'll talk to you another time then. Love you. Goodbye. And I'll hang up. I'm not on the phone after I hang up like, God, I can't believe they didn't hold me. Like, I can't believe that I've held them so many times. And now this and that and the third, those are, those are for you. Cause that'll sometimes occur, but that's for you to like sit with and like, feel yourself because that's really what we're just longing for is that connection to what is what is happening inside of us in my mind in my body in my emotions why are these feelings coming up is there there is no right or wrong so like what's here what's really here what's the substance there yeah absolutely i think right now there's so much going on around us at all times you know, whether that be social justice issues, coronavirus, all of these things that are just happening without our control, asking those questions kind of puts control back into our hands in some way. You know, I think finding a way to have control over what's going on in certain aspects is so important right now because there's so much out of our control. Like, how, how do we get control again? You know, what does that even look like? Is control the illusion? That's kind of what I like to. Why do we need control? <laughs> this Why is we we need go Freudian. We can go like all kinds of places with that <laughs> question. I I feel like right now a lot of times people are feeling like control. Um, there's things that they can control, so it could be some sort of activism. Um, I think some people are feeling like okay, well you know, at least I can do text banking or phone banking for whatever issue or politician or whatever side of whatever argument you're on. Um, that can feel like control. You can be writing, doing some letter writing. Um, you could be doing small things or large things. If people are protesting, people are in the streets 100 nights in a row um, trying to make sure that they're heard or their community is heard or that they're being an ally to some other people. So. Um, I do think that that's a big piece of what's happening right now. And it's, I think in this really dark time that we're all in, we do see some of the best of humanity coming out because people want that control and they want to feel like they can do something or say something that um, will be positive and will be helpful to other people and to themselves and their own spirit, their own soul. I think one of the things though to consider when, when that's happening is like for me with another round, another rally, we had a fair amount of money come in in the beginning 
uh, but the amount of money that we had didn't even come close to matching the number of applications that we had um, within the first week even. We couldn't have even matched um, you know, 95% of the applications that came in. So, um, you know, it's hard when you're in that position, when you're like, I'm going to take a step, I'm going to do something. And then you just feel so overwhelmed by the gravity of the situation, the whole situation. And uh, I had a girlfriend tell me a little story once that might be um, helpful to some other people who are trying to take control and trying to be active in their communities. Um, I was I have a girlfriend who works in NGO work. She's made her entire career out of that, mostly working in NGOs in Africa and uh, focusing on like AIDS reduction. And um, she, uh, in the beginning, I said, you know, I don't, I feel so bad because we don't, there's so much loss here. There's so much need here and we don't have what it takes to match the need. And she said, well, you know, look, this, let me tell you this little story about this girl who's walking along the beach after a very high tide and, the tide had come in and when it left, it left all these starfish on the beach and they were dying because they weren't in the water. And so she ran down to the beach and she started picking them up and throwing them, but there was tens of thousands of them. So she's throwing them one at a time into the back into the sea. And this man walks by and he starts laughing and he says, little girl, what are you doing? You're not gonna be able to save all these starfish. And she just picks one up off the ground and throws it into the sea and says, well, I just saved that one. Uh, so you sort of have to look at it as a piece by piece, a step by step, those little pieces like we were talking about of leadership before where um, you just lead yourself through these moments that are going to give your soul the thing you need to have your mask on first and uh, move forward and know that you're affecting enough people. It, it is enough. You're doing enough. You are in the right place if that's where you're um, trying to take some control. I love that story. It's, yeah. Honestly, it's motivational for me. I'm sure others feel similar, but I think that so much of like when COVID first started and we all went into quarantine, everyone was like, let's learn a new skill. Let's take on a new, you know, task, whatever. And I think everyone's kind of burnt out of that, that schema at this point. Like we have so many tools within inside of us at all times. And I think really like manifesting them and utilizing what you have going on inside of you is now more important than ever before. I think, you know, when we're talking about coping techniques or we're talking about empowering that leader inside of you, I think we need to think about what we do every day. When someone, you know, you get into a fight with a family member or partner, what's that first thing you do to cope with the situation? How do you calm yourself down? How do you get yourself feeling better? Itty bitty things like that are, now's the time to kind of amplify those skills you already have inside of you or take a step back and look like, is this a healthy one or is it not? I think that's an important question first, but then, you know, kind of utilize those skills you have to empower yourself, but then also empower others. I think to support someone else, you have to support yourself first. That is so important. I think we, everyone wants to, you know, be a, lend a helping hand, but it's really hard to do that before you're in a space to provide that support. Yeah, I think also it's easy there in that type of communication to get lost in some bigger ideas, right? Like um, there's been so many eulogies recently about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and she's just this remarkable, larger than life, wonderful human being. I mean, how poetic that she died on the first night of Rosh Hashanah, you know, it just, it, 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 what an incredible life. And one of the things that's really been standing out to me about her is that she like never spoke in anger. That was kind of her signature. And she didn't say the word, um, you know, she took a moment and said her thoughts and all of that. And so for me though, I have a very fiery personality and I think it's unrealistic for me to be like, I want to be just like Ruth Bader Ginsburg and never say anything in anger. And then I've there's now set a bar that is so unattainable because as much as I wish I was, I'm not Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know? So I think it's, um, you know, there's other things though that I could do. Like I can stop and take a deep breath. I can ask somebody when I'm ready to vent, are you ready to hear this? You know, are you, are you ready to hold space for me basically? Uh, so I think there are these little ways in which I can be my own leader to get more 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg like, but without having to have that giant thing of being like, oh, I have to, I have to attain this level of perfect, perfect human uh, life, you know? I use Mahatma Gandhi, but I love Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I'm like, how do I be more like Gandhi? Yeah. Um, right. I, love that. I love that so much because I, not, it's, not speaking out of anger. Generally, when I speak out of anger, I know for myself, it's because I'm triggered. Um, and what does a trigger feel and look like? It's my body tenses, my nervous system is on the fritz, and my head is buzzing with a million and one thoughts. I'm suddenly clenching my hands, even though I know I'm not going to punch anyone. I'm just angry. Um, and I, I, do the, I do the awareness, I, I take a deep breath and I tell myself, hey, anger is here, great. What does anger need right now? And let me not lash out, I'll take a moment, I'll be like, uh, I'm just gonna step out really quick and get some air. You know, giving, my, giving myself what I need first so that I don't react on this person and basically project my feelings onto them. So I, I do that care, but what I love about that saying that she never spoke out of anger is I, I feel like she acted out of anger though. Because yeah. that's, you know, anger is such a beautiful, beautiful tool. It, it creates transformation. It's out of anger is born revolution. Like I'm angry, I'm annoyed, I'm pissed that the world isn't an absolute pleasure. So what did I do? I became a sex coach. You know, like that was, that's what drove me. And I saw that, I saw a need and I saw something that I could give because I love humans and I love beings so much that I want to see them in their fullest expression. And I want to see them in their fullest joy. So out of that anger bore my new career, which I love. And I lost my bar job due to COVID. You know, I had an injury last summer and I was ready to get back to work. And then all of a sudden there was no work. So I was fortunate that months prior to that, I had signed up for a coaching program because I knew eventually that maybe I wanted to do something else, but I didn't, I wanted to have a backup to, to bartending. So I was like, I'll be a coach. And now I find myself in the reversal of like, oh, I'm gonna be a coach and I can be an advocate for, for bartenders. I can bring everything that I learn and use it in this community as well because I no longer see a difference. I'm not trying to separate, I'm trying to unite. And that's like, that was born out of anger. And like, I can, I can feel so many people angry right now. And, and it's, it's there, it's raw, it's real. We're angry at our own leaders we're angry at our community boards. We're angry that there's so much miscommunication going on. And it's like, well, what do we have? What do we, what, what do we do? What do we do with all that anger? How do we transmute it? How do we create that shift, that change within us? Um, and that's really like such a powerful, like it's, it's, like, it's gas. It's all gas. Anger is gas to me. I'm like, let's pump it all in and let me bring it out. Because it's, you know, so many people are afraid to get angry and, you know, we just stay where we are and we sit on that anger and what happens, we, we don't move past it. We kind of just stay and in that Maslow's hierarchy, we don't feel safe because we're holding on to all this anger and we don't, we never were taught how to, how to use it. Um, because I know from example, like my dad would get angry and he'd throw things. Like that was not the anger I wanted to project. When I was drinking, I would get angry and I would punch walls. I have fractured my hand, like all these things. And that wasn't beneficial to anyone. <laughs> so now I'm like, wait, this is anger. I can do something with it. I can use it. Um, so I'm, I wanna create a revolution. And that's a big dream. <laughs> I may never get to see it in my time, but you know, one of my favorite sayings is a person that plants a seed to a tree, knows the meaning of life when he realizes he'll never be able to sit under its shade. You know, it's the gift of what do we, what do we leave behind? What are we creating for not ourselves, but for others? And I think that 
both of you talking about anger is so important because it's inevitable, especially right now, especially people who feel passion the way that, you know, we all do. It's, it's unavoidable, unfortunately, where we're at. But I do want to just highlight the point about it not being a linear process. And it's not always, you know, going in. I feel anger today and I'm going to advocate and go in full force. Right. You're on. I know for me, just like both of you, I am a firecracker. And when I feel anger, I go and I speak my mind and I get it done. And with Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death, first of all, I wasn't even able to really mourn her death because I, all I could think about was, you know, the legality of that. And I fell into the space where I was silent and like almost uncommunicative. Like I could not speak the way I felt to anyone. And for me to be such a firecracker and to be so vocal, I'm very forward on social media about my views and always, you know, active, being active in calling my leaders and calling my senators and politicians. And I just couldn't for like two to three days, I literally couldn't do anything. I was like almost numb. And then I was like, no, I don't. I found that leader in me and pushed forward, but that's okay too. You know, you have to feel your body and connect your mind to your body and know where you're at because it's not always going to be full force forward. And you do, you can take pauses and you should allow yourself those pauses. Your body will always tell yourself your mind where it's at and listening to those instead of ignoring them is so important. Yeah, especially right now. I mean, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I mean, 2020 has been a beat down uh, no matter who you are or where you are. Um, you know, unless you're like some outlandishly rich person just living on your yacht until it's over, you know, but like it has just been so brutal to everybody. And so I think, um, you know, day after day, um, it's important to remember that you can take a minute to to stop and take a breath and that um, you're not going to react to everything in the same way. And I think it, we also have been dealing collectively with um, a sense of we first were kind of in trauma and then we were in a, now we're in a kind of a trauma fatigue stage and mm -hmm. uh, we're in a collective state of mourning. And um, so I think it's really important to note that all of these things, you know, that it's okay to be angry and it's okay to also just take a breath and be quiet. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's my, my favorite saying, it's okay not to be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's absolutely okay. Yeah. Where you are is perfect. I always have to like remind myself that like, this is perfect. This is, I'm not feeling well. Cool. Great. I, I want to be in the covers. Beautiful. Let's do it. And like giving myself that permission is really, I think, was one of the greatest things that I could have learned for myself was this is going to look and feel differently to everyone. And what I need right now is this. Um, yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. And if it's overwhelming, there are resources that are out there. There are plenty of things that are out there that, um, you know, there's, there is some financial help. Um, there's a number of places, obviously you could go to another round, another rally uh, for a number of pieces of financial help. We right now have an LGBTQ focused fund. We have one general fund. We have one for uh, black owned businesses. We have one for black mental health. We are working right now with um, a group with, for women's leadership in our community. So there's a number of things there that you could go and apply for. The USBG also still, I believe, has some funding that they're giving out. Um, the Giving Table, which is just based in Georgia, but they are really doing a lot of very good work there in Georgia. And then CORE um, is the Children of Restaurant Employees. So that's for if you've got a child at home who's sick, um, that, or if you're from a family with children and you have been affected by COVID, they have a, a substantial fund there for people um, in that need. So there are some of those. Um, do you guys wanna talk a little bit about the therapy piece here? Yeah, I just threw up a quick one. Herd.org is doing every Monday, they're doing group therapy sessions led by mental health professionals. But there are so many, especially now that a lot has gone virtual, there are so many resources online. Um, I know Tales Put Together, a beautiful resource page. I know Another Round, Another Rally's website has a comprehensive 
gorgeous resource page to utilize. Um, it's, I know it can feel overwhelming to know what you need when you need it. So I do want to honor that space. Um, but these, even to just kind of scroll through any of these pages really can even open your eyes to some resources you might not know you need. Yeah, I, and then for volunteering, we threw Thirst up here. Thirst is an organization that is helping with um, provide free or um, low cost legal fees to people who are running small businesses and restaurants. Um, they also are working towards legislation and lobbying. That's where their funding is going. And so they've got a substantial um, amount of work that you could be doing in their phone bank. So it's another great place to feel like you're taking control within your own community and doing what you can to help. All you really need there is a phone. So um, it's a really great organization as well. And just like you said, on another run, another rally, there's a whole section of mental health resources uh, on that, on our resource page. Um, and each mental health resource category, we have a whole section within each category. And most of that is free. Uh, I think it's really a strange time because a lot of people are finding themselves in a position of being like, well, I don't need a therapist. I'd, not, I've never needed a therapist before and I myself just started therapy for the first time and I have to tell you it is so nice to have somebody that's not my husband and not my best friend and not my boss and not somebody that I feel like I'm weighing down to just talk through some things and to have her and I talk through some goals and then to have her check on me once a week and make sure that I'm sort of hitting these goals and they can be as small as get up by eight o'clock every day. You know, so it's, um, I encourage it. And if there's some free resources out there, I would say, um, take advantage of it. Now's the time, be the leader. Yeah, and I wanna speak on really briefly, one of the biggest hurdles that I faced um, when it came to reaching out and using these resources personally for me was shame. Um, shame that I was going through this, shame that I wasn't, I'm now looking at not being able to pay bills. So like, what does that mean? Uh, where do I find this money? Like, do I pop it out of a magic hat? Um, but shame, what I discovered from my own personal development is the voice of others. It's not me. The shame doesn't come from me because if I'd listened to shame for a decade before I sought help for um, my alcoholism and drug addiction, and it left me feeling completely drained. It was debilitating. It felt like, how dare I? Like, how could I be, do how could I be going through this? Like, who am I? Um, and I just wanted to voice that because I know that always often comes up a lot for me before I do reach out for any other help is shame will appear. It's like, oh, and I gotta reach out to this person. Like, I need help. Like. I'm going to be a burden, like all those voices. That's not me. Those are others. I'm not a burden. I'm, I'm full of resources as well. Right now, I just don't have that one key. But I know someone who does have the key. And that could be a therapist. That could be my financial aid helpers. And these people know things that I don't know. And that's beautiful. That's great. Because like, if I knew all of that, that would, my head would hurt. <laughs> so I just wanted to voice that and make it apparent that shame may appear and sitting with that as you would with any emotion is just as imperative for getting you to that next step and over that hurdle and reaching your goals. Yes, and I did want to offer, these are our contact information. Um, if, you know, finding resources feels overwhelming, please reach out. We all love lending a helping hand and are more than happy to walk through something with you or discuss something. Yeah, and since this is recorded and it's probably going to be on the YouTube channel, um, we did have some questions that we wanted to ask the audience um, that we're hoping that you can engage in in the comments section if possible. And just so that we're aware, going back to consent, the comments are not places for anyone to lend advice. This is just a space for you to answer the question whatever appears first is absolutely acceptable. You are loved and welcomed in that response. 
and there will be no feedback towards those responses. This is just kind of to get the community gathered in a place and get a feel of where we all are in this space together. Um, Jess, did you want to ask the questions? <laughs> Um, so we have two questions. The first one being, what is one action you can do today to make your community stronger, whatever that community is for you? Um, what is one thing that you think you can bring to the table? And then the second question is, what is one win or insight or learning that you took away from today's discussion? Something that will really hold true to you going forward. We're very curious. Here. Yeah, and I can't wait. I love reading responses and witnessing everyone where they are and loving you exactly where you are. So I'm, ex I'm excited. <laughs> me too. Thank you for joining me. I love today's discussion and I'm so excited to hear everyone's feedback. Likewise. Thanks. Likewise. Thanks for joining everybody. Thank you. So do I.